Um, was everybody here for the last sermon I gave about the retreat? Was anybody not here? Okay, let me, well, I'll give you guys a quick review. Uh, we went to a retreat down in Oregon, and um, a retreat for the WCG, well, GCI. <laughs> Um, uh, Grace Communion International, that's our denomination. That's who we are a part of. And uh, when you're there, it's uh, a bunch of us get together and we eat together, we sleep together, we study the Bible together. And this time we were studying um, some of the stuff that one of our mentors, Baxter Kruger, who is a theologian, and he's alive, and he is, he is a fun guy. He's a kick to talk to and mess around with. And anyways, he gave us a a message on a vision that he had. Now, he doesn't know if it was a vision or it was just his mind, you know, showing him things while he was looking. Anyways, he was looking at Vail, Vail, Colorado, beautiful, beautiful place if you've ever been there. And he was looking up this huge valley, big U-shaped valley, just seemed to go on forever. And in the middle of the valley, all of a sudden a dam appeared. And it was like a big beaver dam. And it wasn't just a little dam. This dam went all the way across the valley, all the way up to the top of the hills. It was a huge, huge beaver dam. And it had two giant logs at the bottom and everything else was built on those logs. Of course, you know, as a Christian, if you have that kind of a vision or a dream or an imagination, and he was praying at the time, and he, he says, okay, Holy Spirit, what is this? Why is this, why am I looking at this? And the Holy Spirit told him, well, in Western Christian culture, there is a log jam, there is a dam that is holding back the flow of the Holy Spirit. And the water behind this is the Holy Spirit. And it's dammed up because there's some false beliefs about my father. And those two logs, one of them, the false belief was lies about the father that the Western world has believed and accepted. And they probably don't know that they've accepted them, okay? And the other one, uh, let's see, what was the other one? The other one was, oh, that the human race is separated from God. And that produces a whole bunch of lies about the Father. And he said, those two logs have given us an understanding of Scripture which is totally and completely contrary to who our Father in Heaven is. Today, I'm going to talk about the lies of God, about God. Specifically, that God doesn't really love us. Have you, can you, have you ever thought about that? Do you ever really sit down and think about, do I truly believe in my heart and mind that God the Father, creator of all things, truly loves me? Because if you look at how Christians look at God, and when you talk to them, they say things like, I have to appease God. I have to do what he wants so that he'll like me. If I don't do what I like, he doesn't, he won't help me. He won't take care of me. It's um, lies about the Father. God cannot forgive without being appeased. Someone has to pay. And we say stuff like, well, Jesus came to earth to pay the price. In a sense, he did. But that's not why he actually came to earth. He came to earth because he loves us. Scripture tells us, if you have seen me, Jesus, you have seen the Father. And in Jesus' entire time on earth, he never, ever required revenge from anyone. He only loved. Everything he did was out of love. That's our Father. So what has happened in the scripture, in the beginning, God starts out that he created all things. That was an act of ultimate love. 
I'm going to create myself a family and I'm going to give them a massive giant playground, Earth. Because that's what Earth is. It's a huge giant playground. It's perfect in its ways. It's got water, it's got air, it's got warm places, cold places, we can ski, we can go out and make love in the bushes. It's a huge place. There's lots of things that we can do on this planet. And it's all because God loves us. And he gives that to all human beings. Because he loves everybody. He may not love some of the things we do, but he loves us. And that is something that we can hold to the core. So in the beginning, Adam and Eve were be bopping around the garden. And one day they happened to come to the center of the garden where the two trees were. And they're looking at them, I guess, whatever they're doing. Of course, old Satan's there. And he starts to talk to them and he, he tells them something. You know, God said you're going to die. You won't die. Really, you'll become like God. In other words, he says, God's a liar. He lied to you. He told you you would die. You won't die. You will live, but you will be like him. You'll know right from wrong. This is a good thing. And unfortunately, Eve and Adam bought it. Why? Do we ever think about why they bought it? They didn't understand God's love for them. They didn't really see it. Because God just came walking along in the garden one day, be bopping along. Of course, he knew what they had done. He says, uh, hey, Adam, Eve, where are you? Uh, well, we're hiding in the bushes because we're naked. Of course, you know, I love that statement. God said, oh, yeah, who told you you were naked? Uh -huh. So he knew. And so we say, at this point, God goes, okay, you're going to have to leave the garden. And these are all the things that are going to happen to you. And Western religion says, this is their punishment for eating of the tree of good and evil. And from there on, all of scripture is looked at as God is taking revenge on man for sinning. And that sin is not loving him. And we go and we read all of scripture from that. And so in our hearts and in our minds, we believe God is a vengeful God. How does human belief structures get formed? It's formed through emotional experiences. Every human being, kind of, this is just an example, has a little locked up closet in their soul, in their heart, in their mind. And there's probably a million doors in front of it so that nobody other than themselves can get in there. And in there is their belief structure. And it's formed by emotional experiences mostly from childhood. One of mine, which got brought up yesterday that I had forgotten about, was that I got failed the third grade. Okay, they told me it was because I was a year younger than everybody else and I needed to be with my own age group. Of course, my little mind was, now nah, I'm a stump. I'm so stupid I can't even do third grade work. And that stuck with me. That was one of my emotional core beliefs. Big black mark right across. If God had loved me, he never would have let that happen. Now, there's lots of other little marks, little frilly, wonderful, beautiful, light-colored marks. Those are the good things that happen. But for whatever reason, I don't know why God made it this way, but evidently he did. Every big fat black mark to be erased has to have 7 to 12 little frilly marks to be able to get around that. However, if you look at your heart and soul and all the things that have happened to you, I guarantee you, you will have fat black mark after fat black mark after, and there's many of them. Um, the day I came home and my mother told me I looked like a girl because I got a cool haircut that I really liked. That was crushing. That black mark says, what you think and what you want is meaningless. It's stupid. It's a waste of your life. Don't do what you want. Do what I tell you to do. Live the life the way I want you to live your life. 
I know you don't. And that stays with you. And that becomes an underlying belief structure. And they all build up, and they build up, and they build up, and we lock them away, and we forget about them. But our subconscious does not. So when we see a vengeful God, that's right. I'm scum, and I deserve to be abused. God has to beat me so that he can be happy. And we spend our whole lives living that thought. Everything we do comes down to those thoughts. Now, hopefully, the Holy Spirit has taken you guys through the journey, and you don't have that feeling anymore. But in your heart of hearts, do you feel like God is a vengeful God? And if you don't do everything he wants you to do, if you don't do work after work after work after work, no matter what it does to you, he can't love you. He won't love you because he must extract revenge. And that's, that's proven. God says revenge is mine, says the Lord. But when you look at it from a negative side that God is evil, oh, what a horrible thing to say. But that's how we feel. God has a bad side. That's just us humanizing him. Trying to make him like us. Trying to justify our existence and all the gyrations and garbage that we go through. It destroys our souls. Jesus came to, to, do, to get rid of that. That's what he came to save us from. We've been forgiven for our sins from the foundation of the world. Lord God Most High does not hold it against us that we don't love him. Because he knows that the time's going to come when he truly reveals himself to your heart, to where your emotional seat is, that you will realize who he is and what he wants. You can't help but love him. You love me because I loved you first. That's what he says. So until he gets into our hearts and allows us to see him for who he truly is, it's hard to love him. And Western theology has worked on, you're going to go to hell if you lie. Personally, I don't believe God's going to put any human being in hell. Our denomination is what's called a hopeful Unitarian when it comes to the afterlife. Which means, we don't know. We haven't got a clue. But we hope and pray that God has a plan to save everyone. Every human being that ever lived or walked this earth, including all those that were aborted, all those that were murdered, all those that were abused and killed, all those that have no idea who he is, those who died thinking he hates them. God is pure love. And he does not will that anybody should perish. And we go on that statement and we hope and we pray. We hope and pray that he has a way to save Satan and the demons. That there's some way, somehow, some way that he's going to save them as well. He's God after all. He can do anything he wants. But we also have to understand that he loves us so much that if we choose not to love him, he will allow us to perish. It's because he loves us. And he wants to spend eternity with a family that loves him and loves each other. So how do we get to that core beliefs? How do we get ourselves in there to see what they are? We have to meditate on our souls. We have to meditate on what do I truly believe about God the Father? Why do I do the good things that I do? All good things come from God. He tells us that in Scripture. But I can remember a time when I would work myself to a frazzle. And I would think to myself, why am I doing this? What were my motives? Am I doing this because I love people and I want to help them out? Or am I doing this to keep God from killing me? To appease him? To prove to him how good I am and that I love him? If you're doing that, I guarantee you will burn out. You will become exhausted. Things will not go very well. But through all that, hopefully, the idea is, is that God will come to you and say, you know, you don't have to do any of this. I am your Sabbath day, Jesus says. Relax. Rest. Don't worry about it. It'll get done. 
Do some, but do it because you want to be close to the Father, because you want to curl up into his lap. You are secure in his love. Everything I do, I do because I want to be close to the Father. And how do you get close to the Father? You spend time with his kids. Brethren, it doesn't matter if they're Catholic or if they're Muslim or whoever they are. They're God's kids. Be kind. Be gentle. Understand that God Most High loves everybody. There's no one he doesn't love. And just because he gives correction, that's not punishment. That's not revenge. God's revenge, he turns you into a God lover. A Christian. A lover of the Most High God. That's the revenge he's talking about. He's not talking about throwing you in hell. He's not talking about giving you cancer. He's not talking about making you lose your job. That's not God. He never does anything evil or bad for any reason. What's in your heart? What's in that hidden away little file? What things have happened to your life that because we see God as a vengeful God, they've become negative? And you can't love God because he hates you. Get into that thing. Pull that folder out. Lay it out before the Holy Spirit and say, you're my teacher. You're my only teacher. You're my strength. You're what gives me the ability to do the things that I do. Erase this stuff. And he'll come up with this big old eraser and he'll just start erasing them. And then he'll put fully beautiful little marks. And at the end... You're still alive because the Lord God Most High loves you. And these things were things that just happened to you and they weren't my fault. I didn't do these things to you. Look at what happened because of this. You learn this. Bad part goes away. He puts in, I learned to love. Takes this away and he says, I've learned to love. He erases the next one. I've learned to love from all those bad experiences when we realize that God loves all those people and he has forgiven all their sins how can we not you know how I've talked about you walking driving down the freeway and somebody cuts you off and the first thing you want to do is throw a grenade at them did you know what happens if your first thought is God loves that person God, with all of his heart, mind, and soul, loves that person. I can't be mad at them. They can't help it if they do stupid stuff. Guess what? There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no anger. There's no lingering frustration three days later. I'm going to, that guy didn't. It's gone. It just goes away. And you don't even think about it again. And if you do, it's good, warm feelings. I didn't get mad at this guy. I didn't want to kill him. I didn't want to pull my gun out and start shooting. That's how God feels. He doesn't want to hurt us. He doesn't want to kill us. He doesn't want revenge. He wants us to sit in his lap and talk to him. Let him comfort us when things are bad. And there's that horrid lie about God that he's a mean, vengeful Zeus with a lightning bolt God. And he's not. And I truly believe in my heart that the main reason Jesus came was to destroy that belief. Because if you believe what Jesus said, that he is the image of the Father, (laughs) look at him. He came to earth. He did good deeds constantly, no matter what they were doing to him. Even on the cross, when they're murdering him, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And we didn't. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. They did not realize that that was God himself on that cross. And if he had been a vengeful God, don't you think he would have called down legions of angels and just wiped them all out? I'll fix you for killing my son. But God the Father did. He says, no. I am proving my love to my children. We are the children of the Most 
high God. You know, we look at David and Bathsheba. From God is evil, David was punished for the child, when the child died. That was his punishment. God got revenge so he could be nice to David again. No, it didn't have anything to do with that. If you read it, God says, you are forgiven, David. I forgive you for what you did. You don't have to die. Because in Israel, they would have stoned him to death and Bathsheba. He says, however, I do want to teach you something. What you did made it so my enemies can laugh at me and ridicule me and have scorn against me. Therefore, I will take the child from you. It wasn't punishment. It was teaching. That's why in our lives, when we do things that are contrary to love, there's always a consequence at the end. God has set it up that way. If you commit adultery and get a young lady pregnant, you have a child to take care of for the rest of your life and all the pain and suffering that goes with that. If you do drugs a lot, you're going to have health problems. You may do some things that are terrible and end up in jail. That's all to make us realize that that's not loving hurts. Now, if you're out there helping people, doing good deeds, doing all that, there's a result from that. Good results. Because in our society, love has been belittled a little bit, a lot. Satan has made it so that love is sex. But love and sex are two different things. Love is that outgoing concern for another individual. Sex is sex. A lot of times it comes out of love. A lot of times it comes out of lust. We need to be able to separate them. And unfortunately, many of our young cannot do that. They just don't understand the difference. So when David was coming to his senses, so to speak, what do you think he realized? He goes, you know, this is pretty bad. I murdered a guy for his wife. I got her pregnant. I lied, did all kinds of horrible stuff. How could I have allowed that to happen? Because David was a man after God's own heart. He learned something that day. And he was prepared for what was about to come. From out of what he did, he has his children, tried to kill him, run him off, all kinds of things. But what he learned that day was, one of the things God wants from us is that we don't give others the ability to ridicule, make fun of God. And so as his children did all the things they did, he reacted lovingly towards that. He was very careful not to do anything that would say, well, you're God's just a vengeful, mean, nasty God. You went out and killed your son. No, he just allowed it. He said, no, be gentle to my son. Don't hurt my son. I love him. It's okay. God will work it out. Everything will work out. That big black line was erased. And love was put in there. When you look at God as a vengeful, mean, nasty God, all of scripture is interpreted from the eyes of a mean, nasty God. But when you start out with a loving, kind, gentle God who loves you more than anything else and everything he does is teaching and correction because he loves you, then all of scripture changes. You know those little balls that shine lights on your house for Christmas? I wish I had one, it would be fun. But it's green. Okay, you turn a dial, it all changes. Now it's red. Turn another dial, and it's all green. Everything changes from that premise. Turn another dial, and it's all three. That's the way it is when we believe a lie about God. How do you change all that? You throw that lie out, and in your heart of hearts, you say, God is love. Everything God does is love. And he wants me to become like him. Is it easy? Oh, no. 
I hadn't realized that, but it's taken seven years for God to get me to understand that. Seven years. And how much, how at rest are you at? Do you truly love? How do you know when the love of God fills you, you don't get angry with anybody about anything? You understand that you and you and you and you are children of the most high God. And when they do something against you, it's not against you they're doing it. It's against Jesus. And Jesus says, I can handle all the sins of the world. You do not have to worry about that. If they're doing something against you, they're doing it against me. And it's okay. Forgive them, because that's what I want. And as people realize, you know what? They really have forgiven me for that. That was kind of a nasty thing I did. But they're not trying to kill me, and they're not taking me to court. They're not, I mean, they just handed me their coat. Hmm. I wonder why. And then they ask you. And you say, well, because I love you. You what? Not sexually. I love you because you're my brother or you're my sister. That's why I gave it to you. They go, yeah, but why? Because Jesus is in me, just like he's in you. Oh, Jesus isn't in me. Yeah, he is. Ask him to show you. That's all you have to do. Because Jesus says, since he was resurrected, he's in everybody. He's there. And all we have to do is get them to ask. Jesus, are you really here? And Jesus has got them at that point. Getting people to come to Jesus is easy. Show love. Tell them to ask. That's all there is. That's all you have to do. You don't have to get up in your soapbox and say, you're going to go to hell if you do this, if you do that. If you do that, nobody's going to come to Jesus. And if they do, they're going to be miserable because they don't understand God. They're still living in the Western theology. You know, Eastern theology doesn't teach that. Our church is an Eastern Trinitarian church. And we're the only one in the United States. Western Trinitarian Church says you have God the Father and he shows himself as this and he shows himself as that. But it's only God. Eastern Trinitarian says you have God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Three individuals making up God. And they're all held together with a crown, which is the, what Jesus did and they all did it together. Jesus was the mouthpiece. Rick reminded me of that yesterday. Huge, huge difference. And we all like to think that we're outside the circle of God, but we're not. We'll get to that next week. But there's God, there's Jesus, there's Holy Spirit. You're in the middle. And these three, no matter where you go, they're here. If you go over here, they're here. If you go over here, they're here. If you say, God, I don't want to be, and you start running off that way, they're still there. God has you. You can't get away. He won't leave you. There's nothing you can do that will make him not love you or leave you. He'll let you screw up all you want. He'll let you drive off a cliff. He'll let you beat somebody up. He won't stop you. Why? Because he wants you to have a life that you want to have. Because you want it. When I was growing up, I was told how to be. I was told what to think. I was told what to do. I was told to be this, that, and the other thing. And I never had the opportunity to be what I thought I should be. God doesn't want that. God wants you to be his son because you want to be his son. With all your heart, mind, and soul, he wants you to be his son. And he is taking us on a ride. It started back in the 90s. When he says, no, you guys got a lot right, but you got a lot wrong too. But guess what? I've assembled you for a reason. In amongst your group, those who are going to stay are the hearts and minds and souls that I can talk to, that I can teach, that I can mold. And the day is going to come when everybody that he has chosen for this, it's going to explode on the world. The Christian world is going to be corrected. 
Lord God Most High is going to say, look, folks, I am the God of the universe, and I love you. And don't think that I don't. I want you to understand that I love you. You are mine. And all you have to do is realize that you don't have to do it alone. I never intended for you to do it alone. Basically, he says, I'm going to do it for you. All you got to do is sit back and come on the ride. Love me. So what is the conclusion of the matter? It's the same conclusion that it always is. You have to take the kingdom by force. You and 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 me. I have to go into my soul. I have to go down to my little filing cabinet. I have to drag it open. And I have to say, God, help me fix this mess. I am a mess. And I'm a mess because I was taught to be a mess. Satan's a booger. He's a rotten, no good son of a gun. He just wants to kill me. But I understand that you love me. Make me know it. I don't want to just feel it. I must know it. And he will slowly but surely take you through all the things that happened to you as a child that in a child's mind you made into this big, huge, horrible thing. And you'll go, oh, okay. I understand why my parents said what they said. It's not that they thought I was stupid or that I really looked like a girl. But it was, if you have that haircut, then you are identifying yourself with that culture. Now, if they'd have said that, it would have made sense. That because they reacted the way they reacted, they said what they said. And a young mind took it this way. And since that young mind had no grounding in God, it went down into my little orchestra right and said, you're nothing. And it stayed there. It hurt so much that you just didn't want to look at it. So the subconscious buried it but it became one of those precepts by which you lived and made your decisions. Same thing with your belief of God. Is he a wonderful, loving, kind, gentle God? Or is he mean, vengeful? You gotta pay God. And to make him happy, you do what he wants or else. You look at Israel, you look at all the things that happened to Israel. They didn't do what he wanted, he punished them. No, he didn't. They didn't do what he told them and they said they were gonna do. They got rotten and then they got invaded because they got lazy and didn't protect themselves and God allowed it he didn't cause it sometimes the scripture will say that he moved a nation to do things but he was moving it because they needed to be taught a lesson they needed to learn something they needed to go to school for a while and sure enough things got bad and they go oh yeah that's right we forgot to honor our agreement with God okay we'll do it again and things are wonderful for a while. But they never learned. From one generation to the next. And that brings me to one more thing. I have realized something that I had never realized before, that our kids don't understand anything because we haven't taught them. For some reason, I just assumed they would pick it up by osmosis. But they don't. We have a little tiny congregation here, but there's hundreds of years of Christian experience here. There's a great deal of knowledge and understanding, hearts that have been transformed by the Holy Spirit, who you hear a message like this and you're thinking to yourself, wow, is that possible that I'm in that? Do I still believe these old beliefs? Is it still in there? Have I not rooted it out? Have I not gone to the Holy Spirit and said, dig this out of me. Help me see why I cannot love you and why I still get mad at people, why I still abuse people, why I still abuse myself by being angry with somebody because they do something. Is it still in me? Because I've learned something lately over the last year. I'm a lot happier than I ever was. Why? Because I don't care what other people do. It doesn't matter if they get mad or if they treat me bad, cut me off on the freeway. It doesn't matter. Because when the love of God fills you, <laughs> who cares? I don't live in this world. 
I live in the kingdom of God, which is part of this world. But I'm not bound to Satan and his rules. I have bound myself to the rules of love, the rules of God. Am I perfect? Of course not. I'm never going to be perfect. I'm human. I got Satan against me and I got my own human nature against me. I don't know, no of us you weren't here, but a long time ago we had a sermon of two doors in your brain, one to Satan, one to God. Well, when you become a Christian, like David was, that door is permanently opened. And there's a telephone line to God all the time. However, there is a loudness dial on it. And it just struck me of why David did what he did. And there are times when we turn that dial down because our human side wants to do something and we know it's contrary. When David looked at Bathsheba, he had already been turning that knob down. And we know that because he hadn't gone out to battle like he always did. Something had changed. And God, through all this, was telling him, David, turn it back up. And when Nathan the prophet came to him and convicted him, he turned it back up. He goes, oh, sorry, Dad. That was really bad of me. And I'm truly sorry for what I did. I've learned my lesson. It was a horrible lesson, but I understand why it happened. And then he got Solomon, who became one of the greatest kings, one of the greatest teachers of all time, from the same woman. But this time it was from marriage, from love, from being connected with God. And if you look at David's life, for most of the rest of his life, he didn't do a lot of horrible things. He was pretty God-centered from then on. And you know, a lot of our bad things, they will God-center us when we look at them from God's eyes. What is the good thing that came from that? The good thing is you realize that if your dad was mean to you, it wasn't because he hated you like we think God does. It was because he, he didn't know any better. Maybe he thought it was a loving thing to do. You don't know that. So from God's point of view, you say, well, my dad loved me. I know he did. And it's okay that he couldn't do anything else, that he did what he did. I just, that's okay. My dad loved me. That's all that matters. Everything else is forgivable. Or in my case, my mom was a domineering woman. And she forced her will on us right up until the day she died, at least she tried to. She helped ruin more marriages and her kids and anything else. But it wasn't because she hated me, even though sometimes I thought she did. Sometimes I thought it was just because she was so selfish that she had to have everything her own way. But it was really because she loved us. And when you go back to her abusive childhood, her dad was horribly abusive to those girls. You can understand why she was the way she was. But from all that, I am what I am. And God has made something good out of it. I'm rotten, but in God, I'm good. Isn't that interesting? Our human nature is nasty. And it's okay. God says, hey, I'm more powerful than that. Look at Jesus. He had human nature. He lusted after women. He lusted after power. He lusted after all these things a little bit. But he never did anything with them. He just said, no. Why? Because God is more powerful than we are. And with God, we can do anything. And anything that we need to want to do is love. It's amazing how a person's attitude will change if they've done something. And you say, it's okay, don't worry about it. I do that at work a lot with my employees. No, don't worry about it. No, I'm not going to write you up. We know what happened. This is what we're going to do to keep it from happening again. Or this is what you're going to do to keep it from happening again. You've told me that's what you're going to do. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do. You tell me what you're going to do. And then you hold them to it. You just come up and say, okay, you said you were going to do such and such. How come you didn't? Well, listen to what they say. say. Okay, this is number two. And lo, you get three tries. So anyways, and then sure enough, by the third time, there's an attitude change. There's a heart change. And after that, they change. That's love. That's God being kind, gentle, forgiving. 
So dig deep, folks. Go long, so to speak. Get into your heart of hearts. Go to the Holy Spirit, get in Daddy's lap, and you dig deep. Yeah, there's going to be some pain. There's going to be some memories that you do not want to remember. There's some horrible stuff that's happened to a lot of us. Horrible, horrible stuff that never should have happened. But once we realize that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit were there, just like when those two towers came down, Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, the Father, were there. And there's a lot of Christians there that will tell you, I really felt God that survived. We have a president who needs God desperately. Now, he has Christian beliefs. Rick was telling me that he saw a film and his Bible was tattered like our Bibles are. Just tattered. So the man, I believe, if that is his Bible, believes in God. He made a statement that he said he's going to turn all the credit of Washington back to God. Of course, he was talking to evangelicals and Christians at the time. But if he means that, we need to give him the benefit of the doubt. We need to love him. We need to pray hard for him, just like we have President Obama. I guarantee you, President Obama has been the best president that he's been because of the Christians praying for him. Whoever we voted for, whatever we thought, whatever we feel, makes no difference now. God has put his mark on Donald Trump. I'm not going to say that God made him be elected. I'm saying that God allowed it. Therefore, his mark is on him. And we need to pray hard that he listens to the Holy Spirit. You know, you look at the man. He's, he's on his third marriage. But Mrs. Trump looks to be very happy. She does. She looks like she's a very happy woman. And they've been married, what, 18 years now, something like that? So he learned his lesson. Give him the benefit of the doubt. And he needs prayers to understand that he is now the most powerful human being on earth. He holds complete and total destruction of this planet in his hand. All he has to do is push the little red button. And it's all over for humanity as we know it. That kind of power without the Holy Spirit to guide it, he's going to get corrupted. That's how I know that President Obama has the Holy Spirit. He is a Christian man. He was able to go through his entire presidency. There's never been one scandal about him at all. Did you know that when President Obama ends his day at work, he went home and he sat down with his kids and had dinner and he helped them with his homework and he and his wife did whatever they did and then they would sit there for about three hours and read. Reading the stuff that they needed to read so that he could be a good president. I know we all like to give President Obama a hard time, but he's been a very good president. And it was interesting to hear that Donald Trump says, well, I'm not going to destroy Obamacare. I'm going to fix it. And we need to stop calling it Obamacare. It is the American health plan, and it's necessary. We need it. And it needs to be improved. It needs to be made to where all Americans don't even have to call up. They just go to the doctor, and it's taken care of. That just needs to be the way it is. The human being, the human body, needs to be taken care of. And that's just the way it is. So my our hope is that our prayer for Donald Trump will be that he will understand the love of God. That he will realize that his job is to take the distribution of wealth, which the Democrats want, and is right. And rather than doing it through force, he goes to those who have the wealth and say, look, God has given you all this wealth. You are responsible to take care of all the people that God used to give you that wealth. All the workers, all the American people, everybody. That's how it should work. And there's lots of ways he can do it. But he has to listen to God. He has to feel God's love. He has to get away from this God is a vengeful God. You make people pay. No. You don't make people pay. 
you let them go. If they ask for your shoes, give them your cloak. Kind of a thing. And this lie about God, of course, was given by Satan himself. And it was given to us at the Garden of Eden. And it's something that I tell you, we've all believed at one form or another, one part or one another. And it comes down to statements like these. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, is your core belief about the Father? God only tolerates me when I do good, and I must suck up to Jesus when I do evil, so God won't kill me. Or, because, because I am unworthy of being loved by God, but God loves Jesus and will give him whatever he wants. He really does not love me, but Jesus does. Those kind of statements, are they in there? Are they the basis of what we think and do? If you can't forgive people immediately, if you don't immediately say God loves them, therefore, fine, whatever, I guarantee you one of those statements is down in there somewhere. And guess who can help you get rid of that? There's only one. It's not Jesus. It's not the Father. That has been given to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. I'm not. Tom Torrance isn't. Baxter isn't. Randall Dick isn't. You yourself are not. The Holy Spirit is, and he is your only teacher. And we need to learn to listen to him. You know, it's something interesting, and I don't know why, but I'm sure I'll find out. When I was getting ready to vote, I sat down, and I went to God, and I said, Dad, who do you want me to vote for? I haven't got a clue. They both got good and bad. Who do you want me to vote for? I'm a solid Trump supporter, okay? But he said, I want you to vote for Hillary Clinton. What? Yeah, I want you to vote for Hillary Clinton. Okay. Why? I don't know why. But someday he'll tell me why. And then, boy, was I surprised when she lost. <laughs> you know, I figured, okay, she's the one you want. You, know, you can't figure out God sometimes. It just, the things he does are so amazing. You just sit back and you just have to go, okay, whatever, you're the boss, I'm not. And that might be all it was. Will he really do what I ask him? Let's find out. Now, I've been going on for a long time here, but this is so incredibly important. This is the crux of what it is to be Christian. Is that don't get so self-righteous in your own beliefs that you won't listen to the Holy Spirit. Old WCG had that. I don't know how many of you know about our denomination, but we were all denomination of law. You did this, 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 and this, and you were good with God. And God grabbed us by the throat and smacked us on our head and said, no. Uh-uh. It's not that way. It's you love me, and I love you, and everything else is forgiven. That's what it is. So those who could accept that are still here somewhere amongst the group. The rest are gone, and they're still miserable. Because God the Father is love, period. He tells us that in Scripture. And our job is to become like Him, which is become love. Put ourselves aside. And it is so wonderful. It is so wonderful not to be angry at somebody. It is so wonderful to be kind and gentle and not care what anybody says about you or what anybody does. Sure, you feel it a little bit, and it takes time to get that way. But the farther you go towards God, the farther you go and the farther you go, the easier it becomes. And you get into this mindset where you're talking to God all the time. You want to be with his children all the time. You've got your face in his book. Of course, me, I have trouble reading, so I meditate a lot. Read a little bit and think about it and remember all the things he said. But however you do it, it doesn't matter. If you like to go to your closet and get down on your hands and knees, that's fine. If you like to go hiking in the woods and talk to God the whole way, that's fine. He doesn't mind how you do it. All he wants is a relationship with you, a loving, kind, gentle relationship where he takes care of everything. And like I tell Ed every time we pray, when he comes and hands you his hand to take you to eternity, just take it and go. Do not look back. 
There's nothing here for you. Everything is through that door with God. Whether you go to sleep for 100 years or whether you go right to heaven, don't matter. And yes, Ed, your name is written in the book. And all of your names are written in the book of life. You will live forever with God. You can tell everybody that if you want to, that your last name is God. Because you are in his family. And the cool part is, all the rest of their last names is God. They just don't know it. We are his family. And we just have to choose to be there forever. So I please, I beg you, dig into your soul. Reach deep. Pull out that file. Hand it to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to erase it. Ask him to show you that you don't have to suffer. That you don't have to be miserable. You don't have to get upset because somebody slighted you. Or somebody took your job. Or somebody abused you. Or somebody torpedoed you and now you don't get your job. Or somebody cut you off in the freeway. It doesn't matter. It really, truly doesn't. Because God loves you. That is the lie that we must work to destroy. When you see somebody being evil to somebody, say, look, it's okay, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you're going to do or what you think. God loves you. Plant that seed, plant it everywhere. All these poor folks that are out there um, rampaging the cities because Donald Trump got elected, they need to understand that it's okay. God's got control and God loves you. They all, everybody believes in God. I don't care what they say they do. They all know there's a higher power. But they don't think he loves them. They, he hates me. He wants to kill me. He wants to throw me in hell forever. No, he loves you. He wants you with him forever. He wants you to get into his lap and cry. He wants you to get into his lap and listen to him. Or just sit there while he strokes your hair. That's what he wants. But Satan does not want anybody to know that. Because he hates. So as you go about and as you preach the gospel, preach love. Simply tell him, God loves you. And I'm not sorry about it. It's wonderful that God loves you. And if you don't believe he's in you, ask him, are you in me? And then stand back and watch the miracles. Because if they're really truly ask that, then the Father has called them. The Father. I'm thinking that the thing that Jesus loves you is not wrong, but it, it perpetrates the misleading a little bit, doesn't it? Like Jesus loves you, but... Yeah. That's essentially what I'm trying to say. That's why Jesus said, I am the image of the Father. And they have to understand that. That you see Jesus and this loving, kind, gentle guy, <laughs> guess what? That is the Father. Yeah. Loving, kind, gentle guy not the big old meanie that wants to kill you. Because what they don't realize is Jesus is the word, is Yahweh, is the I am of the Old Testament. People think that that God was the father. He wasn't. And that's another one of those lies that are perpetrated out there. So just remember, there's a lot more lies that come from that lie. And one of them is that you're separated from God. And we'll talk about that next time. So as I have done and I'm still doing, dig deep. Go into those archives. Pull out those big black lines. Turn them over to the Holy Spirit. Let him show you the truth of that. And the truth of that is that you have been loved. You've always been loved. And those things, just one of those things that happened and we saw them wrong. And it's, it's hard. There's a lot of pain in those. But Jesus wants to take that away. And he'll do it in the Father's lap.